I'm sure most of you guys have seen our launch of the subset channel, Dr. MK7 Basics, where we look at different aspects of the preclinical sciences where we're going to be covering pathology, microbiology, physiology, pharmacology, and many more from the basic sciences and the preclinical sciences that you need to have a strong foundation in your clinicals. It doesn't mean that I've actually abandoned this channel. I've actually given myself time to complete some of the topics that I started on this particular channel so that they don't remain hanging. And I checked through my surgical playlist and I realized that I did start on the breast pathologies, but I only did inflammatory breast, breast pathologies, which I'll leave tagged at the end of this particular video. So I haven't abandoned you guys, though if you haven't subscribed to the Substit channel, what are you waiting for? I'll leave the pinned comment in the comment section to the link to our subset channel. For now, grab your piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at benign breast pathologies. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time I post on our road to 20,000 subscribers. I have given myself a target of 25,000 subscribers before this year ends. So do you think that we can reach 25,000 subscribers? If so, continue sharing the link to the particular channel. So remember when it comes to the breast, I already covered much of the anatomy in the previous video when, where we looked at inflammatory breast pathology. So I won't go through that anatomy once again because I already assume that if you're watching this video, you have already watched that particular video. If you haven't watched that video, pause the video right now and click on this link and go and watch that video on inflammatory breast pathologies, then you can come back and watch this video. Otherwise, this video will not make any sense. So remember, when you're dealing with breast pathologies, you simply want to have an approach to how you're going to be dealing with these things. I hope I won't bore you and this lecture won't be unduly long because of the very first part that I've added to this particular lecture. All patients that are going to be presenting to you with breast lumps should have what is known as a triple assessment, where you perform a clinical assessment, which is going to be entailing history and physical examination. I'll look at the important things you ask on the history, as well as how to do a physical examination. I will explain an overview. Then you also need a radiological assessment, which is going to be either a mammogram or an, or an ultrasound, depending on the age of the patient, if the patient is less than 35 or if they are older than 35. Then of course you have pathological assessment, which is either getting a biopsy through a fine needle aspiration or a true cut biopsy. I'll talk about all those very shortly. So remember our clinical assessment is going to be pretty much our history and physical examination. What questions do we want to ask if someone presents with a breast lump, if someone presents with breast pathology? So obviously you want to take an approach like you're taking a normal history, but of course we're going to be focusing and zeroing in specifically on the breast lumps. So your demographics are very important. So the age of the patient, remember that younger patients are susceptible to benign conditions, older patients you want to think malignant conditions. But that doesn't mean that an older patient cannot have a benign condition and that doesn't mean that a younger patient cannot have a malignant condition. It's just that they are not so common. Of course, your presenting complaint would be this patient has a breast lump. So you should ask when the lump was first noticed. Don't ask when the lump started because when it was first noted could not be the, when the lump first came. Uh, ask what brought the patient to notice the lump. Is it because of the pain? Is it because of swelling or anything else? What symptoms does it cause? Is there any skin changes like ulcerations, dimpling, any nipple changes, any nipple discharge? Has the lump changed in size over the past few months, over the past few weeks, over the past days? Has it increased in size? Has it decreased in size? Does it come and go? Then has it ever disappeared? Has it ever healed? Does the patient have any other lumps in the other breast or any other lumps on the body? And what does the patient think caused the lump? Is it because there was a trauma or something that happened or they don't know what caused the lump? Is there any associated pain? Are there any other associated symptoms? For example, in the respiratory system, if it's a malignancy, you're thinking, could it be that this pathology has spread to the lungs? 
So do they have any shortness of breath? Do they have any chest pains? Do they have any cough? Are they coughing out blood, which is hemoptysis? Has it spread to the liver? Is Have they noticed any yellowing of the skin or the eyes, any abdominal distension? It could be spreading to the bone. Have they noticed any back pain? It could be these hard nodules on the skin, if it's skin metastasis or swelling of the arm, especially if it's in relation to axillary lymphedema. In the past, in medical and surgical history, you want to ask for any history of any prior operations, could be lumpectomies, excision biopsies, any history of breast cancer, any history of ovarian cancer, any history of them getting radiation exposure, any history of them using contraception. This is very important, especially those that have estrogen in them. You want to ask about our guy in history, their last menstrual period, is it regular? What is the volume? How long does it last? When did they attain menarche? When did they attain menopause? Because remember, all these things are dealing with estrogen exposure, which is a risk factor for breast cancer. The age of the first pregnancy or the first child, the number of children that they have, the spacing in between the children, and when the last child was, the breastfeeding or they're not breastfeeding and the last time they breastfed, is there any family history of breast cancer? And remember, this should be a first degree relative, either a mother, a sister, or a daughter. Then in the social economic history, you should ask about their diet. Is it having a lot of fatty foods in it? Any obesity or sedentary lifestyle? Any history of smoking and alcohol? Those are just some of the basic outline that you're going to be using to take a history in someone who comes in with a breast lump. Then in terms of an examination, remember there are two types of examination that can be done on the breast. There's a clinical examination that you as a practitioner are going to do, and there's a self-breast examination that you should be able to teach the patient. Yes, even if you're a male practitioner, even if you're a male student, you should be able to teach a female how to perform a breast examination. So I'll begin with a self-breast examination. So this should be encouraged in all women of all ages to perform a monthly self-breast examination. It's usually done quite well when they're bathing in a shower. So in a shower, they should use the um, three middle fingers. So pretty much the um, index finger, your middle finger, and your ring finger. And these are going to be checking the entire breast and the armpit area by pressing down lightly medium as well as with firm pressure when they're in the shower. They should check both sides of the breast to feel any lumps, any thickenings, any hard knots, or any breast changes that they can actually see. They should also stand in front of a mirror and inspect the breast with the arm on the side. So they should then raise the arm overhead, over their head, raise their arm and then inspect the breast. Look at the contour of the breast, any swellings that they can see, any dimpling of the skin that they can see, any changes in the nipple. Then the next is to, for them to raise their palms on their hips and press them as they flex their chest muscles. So if you put your arms around your waist and both of them around your waist and you press them so that you can flex your chest muscles, press them against your waist, then the left and the right breast will not be actually the same because these symmetry is actually not really there in the body. Even the left side of your body is not exactly like the right side of your body. So they should look for any dimpling, any puckering or any changes that are noticed on one side. And remember that even though the breasts have asymmetry, it shouldn't be so much. It shouldn't be so obvious. Then they, when they're lying down, they should spread. This allows the, the breast to spread evenly on the chest. So they lie down with one arm underneath the pillow and then the for example if they're examining the left breast the left arm will be underneath the pillow if they're examining the right breast the right arm will be underneath the pillow and then with the other arm that is free they should palpate with light medium and firm pressure so that they can note any masses and lumps then they should repeat the process with the other breast after they are done with this they should squeeze the nipple and this enables them to check for any discharge so that's how they should perform a self breast examination then in terms of the clinical examination this is done by you as a health practitioner so before any examination make sure that you do your preliminaries you greet your patient you get consent, you explain what you're about to do, you wash your hands, and then of course, there should be a chaperone if there is a, a male practitioner 
of course, obviously examining a female practitioner because you would be accused of certain things. So the chaperone could be a nurse or any female staff member that is around and you should ask the patient if it's okay for the chaperone to be there. Before you actually perform your breast examination, explain to the patient and ask them if they've noticed any lumps, if they've noticed any problems like tenderness, any discharge in the breast because if the left breast is tender. You don't want to start with that breast. You want to start examining the right breast. If they don't know how to do a monthly self-breast examination, this is the important time to actually teach the patient on how to do the monthly breast examination and they should repeat the steps that you teach them. So then you should adequately expose your patient. So the full exposure is going to be exposing the entire chest. And then later on, you may actually expose only like the top half of the trunk. And you may sometimes even expose just one breast. But usually ideal exposure should be the full exposure of the chest. Then because the breasts are going to be be swollen and they become tender especially before the menses because of the increase in the amount of estrogen that is present in the body the best time for you to actually examine the breast is about five to seven days after the onset of menstruation so the nodules appearing during the premenstrual phase you should reevaluate them at a later time to see if they're still there because what you may think that is maybe a nodular breast could not be it's just because of the effects of estrogen before they have their menses. So the first thing that you're going to be doing is general inspection. So ideally you're going to ask the patient to sit and at the foot end of the bed, uh, you're going to ask the patient to sit upright and ideally you could even ask them to dangle their legs on the side of the bed and you're going to be facing the patient head on. You're going to be noting any obvious masses, any swelling, any skin changes, any scars, any obvious asymmetry, or any nipple discharge that you can see. Then when you come to close inspection, you're going to inspect the breast and the nipples with the patient in the following positions. So one is they're, they're going to be, the legs are hanging off the bed, their arms are going to be lying on the side of the thighs and they're going to be relaxed. Then the next maneuver that you're going to perform is you're going to tell them to press against their hip and to push inwards. This is going to be tensing the pectoralis major. I'll show you some pictures of how this is done because it's going to be causing the tension in those suspensory ligaments in the breast. Then you also ask them to put their arms over their head and then with their arms over the head, you may also ask them to lean forward. When you're doing these different maneuvers, you're going to be checking for any scars, any small scars that may indicate they had a lumpectomy, any large diagonal scars which may indicate maybe they had a mastectomy, the size of the breast, remember that they may vary be between different individuals. Some have bigger breasts than others. Others have mosquito bites. I'm only joking. Then you comment on symmetry. So of course there will be slight differences between the left and the right, but it shouldn't be quite significant. If it's quite significant, then this may be pointing towards a pathology. You check for any masses that look obvious, the size and the position. You also check for any skin changes, any color changes, any thickness of the skin, any unusually prominent pores, which you call pore d'orange, which is like a peel of an orange. Then you examine if the skin is uh, pulled in or if it's puckered, this may be pointing towards a cancer. You examine and check if there's any redness or erythema, which could suggest local infection or even a superficial malignancy, any thickening or prominence of the pores, which may sometimes suggest inflammatory breast cancer, any puckering that may indicate malignant uh, cancer. Like I told you, the pore d'orange, because you're blocking this skin lymphatics that is by the cancer cells, and then this causes the skin to appear like a peel of an orange, and this may indicate inflammatory breast cancer. So you also check and examine the nipples for their contour. You note any masses. Remember, all this is still just on inspection. You note that there are any masses, any dimpling, any flattening of the nipple. And remember that flattening of a normally convex breast is supposed to be suggestive of cancer. You check if the nipples are retracted. This may be congenital. It may be due to an underlying tumor that is pulling on the nipple or even a duct ectasia. The direction in which the nipples are pointing, the asymmetry in the direction of the nipples and where they are pointing sometimes could also be pointing towards an underlying cancer. Check for any rash, any ulceration or any discharge. And remember, ulceration and rash could sometimes be Paget's disease of the breast. You check for any nipple invasion. Remember, fixed and recently flattened or even depressed nipples are suggestive of nipple retraction. And remember a retracted nipple is going to be broad, it's going to be thickened and this may also point you towards underlying breast cancer. 
So these are the maneuvers. Of course, you're going to start off with the patient with their arms on their side, then with their arms pressing against their um, uh, hip there, or you could do in this position like that with your arms over the head, then with your arms over the head leaning forward. So you, you cycle through these different positions and you're inspecting for the top contour, the symmetry of these breasts, and any obvious changes that you can see of the breast as well as the nipple in each of these positions. Then as they place their arms over the hip and they lean forward, this is going to be helping out bringing out any nipple dimpling that, or any dimpling of the breast or any retraction of the nipple that you may not have seen with them just seated upright. So you're going to be asking the patient to actually press their hands against their hip. Then this helps to contract your pectoral muscles and to also place their hands over their head and lean forward. So you should inspect for the contour of the breast. If they are quite large and they are pendulous, they are swinging about, it may be useful actually to have the patient stand and then to lean forward. But of course, you, they should be supported by the back of a chair or the examiner's hands. Remember, if you notice any dimpling or retraction of the breast, this may also be suggestive of underlying cancer. Because remember, when cancer or anything that is associated with the fibrous strands of the breast, it's going to, uh, and these fibrous strands are attached to both the skin and the fascia of the underlying pectoral mus uh, muscles. Then if you have contraction of the pectoral muscles, it will cause the fascia to be pulled inwards. And this is what is going to be causing the dimpling. So sometimes these signs are associated with benign lesions. So it's not always that there's cancer. So it could be, for example, ductectasia. It could be post-traumatic fat necrosis. So it's always very important to further evaluate this patient. Then you're done with the inspection. So all those things are what you're doing on inspection. You're going to now ask your patient to lie flat. And of course, one arm is going to be placed underneath the head. So the, uh, the side where you are examining the breast, they're going to be placing the arm they're going to be placing the arm underneath the head. And then, of course, you're going to be using palpation of that particular breast. So before you actually begin to examine the breast, if you didn't ask at the beginning of your examination, you must always ask if which breast is painful, if they're having any symptoms and which side they're having symptoms, because you want to start with the side where they are not experiencing symptoms. And remember, a full thorough examination should take three minutes for each breast. So roughly about six minutes for you to complete this examination. You want to palpate all four quadrants of the breast, including the axillary tail, which is going to be extending in the upper outer quadrant there into the axilla. And you're going to be using the finger pads of the second, the third, and the fourth fingers, and you keep them slightly flexed. There are two systematic ways in which we can do this. Remember, we can go in the clock, we can make the breast appear like a, the, the clock of a, uh, the face clock, like 12 o'clock, one o'clock, and then you're going clockwise in that manner. Or you could divide the breast into quadrants and you're examining each quadrant, moving outwards. Or you could go in a spiral manner where you're starting from the nipple, going in circles, moving outwards in a circular manner. So you're going to be palpating you're going to be palpating with light palpation, with medium palpation and deep palpation. And then this is going to be noting any nodules, any masses that you can feel inside the breast. So you're going to be noting for the consistency of the breast. So normally, normally you should have palpated a lot of breasts to actually note that this is normal consistency. This is not a lumpy breast. This is not a breast with a mass. So generally, uh, when you palpate, it's going to depend in part on the relative proportions of the firmer glandular tissue and the soft tissue. So generally, you may have physiologic nodularity that may be present, and this tends to increase before the menses. Like I said, usually you want to examine the breast five to seven days after the menses have started. Then there's going to be this firm transverse ridge of compressible tissue along the lower margin of the breast, especially in the large breasts. So this is a normal infl in, in inframammary ridge and it's not a tumor. So don't be surprised, it's not a tumor. Then you also check in for any tenderness as in premenstrual fullness. So if you detect a mass, then you should complete the thorough examination of that breast and even the remaining breast, then you come back and examine the mass. Don't forget, like I say, to palpate the axillary tail, which is going to be extending into the axilla. And the majority of breast cancers actually are going to be in the outer 
upper outer quadrant because that's where you find most of the breast tissue. So you should examine that area. So if the patient is reporting any nipple discharge at the end of your palpation, you can ask the patient to actually squeeze the nipple to demonstrate this discharge. So if it is yellowish or greenish in color, it could be infection. If it's greenish discharge, it could be dactectasia. If it's blood discharge, this is usually suspicious of malignancies. So you repeat the process of palpation with the other breast. And of course, you ask the patient to alternate their hand and place the other hand underneath their head. So like I said, this is a spiral technique where you're palpating from the nipple outwards in a spiral manner until you reach your axillary tail and don't forget to palpate the axillary tail. So you should also palpate the axillary tail. Then you should, uh, at the end of the examination, ask the patient to squeeze their nipple to express any discharge. Or you could ask the patient if you can actually squeeze their nipple because some people can find this quite uncomfortable. Then if you notice that there's a mass, when you're coming back, you're going to be noting the size, the border, the consistency and fluctuance of that mass. As you can see, there's a mass over here. How you check for fluctuancy, you have both fingers on the opposite sides and then you apply pressure in the center like that. You feel the bulging on both sides. Then you see that there is fluctuancy. So for every lump, you're going to be checking for, this, for these following things. You want to know the position where the slump is, which quadrant of the breast is it in? Is it in the upper outer quadrant? You obviously are going to be using the clock face metaphor. For example, if it's at two o'clock, three o'clock, six o'clock on the breast. How far from the nipple is the mass located? For example, it's four centimeters away from the nipple. The relative size and the shape Remember, this is approximate dimensions. It could be a two by three, and the shape could be spherical, elongated, or irregular. The consistency, is it smooth? Is it firm? Is it stony? Is it rubbery? Any overlying changes you can see, is there any redness? Is there any puckering of the skin? How mobile is it? Does it move freely? Does it move with the underlying skin? Does it move with the pectoral contractions? Then, of course, you check for fluctuation, which I already told you. If you see that there's fluctuation that is present, usually this is most commonly associated with cystic masses. Then you palpate each nipple, noting for the elasticity. Of course, this is how you check for fluctuancy. Rather, you palpate for the mass, rather, not fluctuancy. Palpate for the mass to see if it's fixed to the underlying tissues. You should also examine the axilla for any lymphadenopathy. This could be seen in malignancy, it could be seen in infection. So have the patient actually sit at the edge of the bed facing you, then of course, it'll be like as if you're greeting your patient. If you're examining the left axilla, their left arm is supposed to be resting on your left arm. And then with your right arm, you're going to be examining the axilla. And if you're examining the um, right side, their right arm should be resting or supported on your right arm, and then you're using your left arm to examine the axilla. So you're also going to be palpating other lymph node groups like the submental, the submandibular, the preauricular, the subauricular, the postauricular, suboccipital, cervical, supraclavicular, infraclavicular, and parasternal. To complete your examination, you want to thank your patient and cover them up, summarize the findings, and of course suggest any further assessments like a fine needle aspiration or a core biopsy to determine histology, an ultrasound or mammogram to determine or rather depending on the age to determine the radiological appearance of this pathology as well as a chest x-ray if necessary. So of course this is like what, what I was saying, if you're examining the right axilla, the right arm is resting on your right arm and your left arm is examining the axilla like that to detect the lymphadenopathy, you repeat with the other side. So you examine both axillae. Then you examine for the lymph nodes, the infraclavicular, supraclavicular, and cervical. Remember, you should be behind the patient when you're examining these particular lymph nodes. So here he's palpating for the infraclavicular lymph nodes, here the supraclavicular, then here the cervical lymph nodes. Okay, so remember, we're still talking about breast assessment. So the first thing is clinical assessment, where you look at the history, and physical examination, we're done with that. The next thing is, of course, radiological uh, assessment, where we are going to be now using imaging. Here we use two types of imaging. The reason why we're using these different imaging in different ages is because of two important reasons. One, the breast density tends to change with age of a patient. Number two, even the size of the breast tends to change with age of a patient. Generally, older patients have larger breasts, so it's easier to put them in between the two plates of the mammogram, as opposed to a younger patient who may require an ultrasound. So in essence, we're going to be using ultrasound for patients that are less than 35, 
and a mammogram for patients that are above 35. Remember that ultrasound is very useful when you're evaluating a lump which is solid or cystic, and a mammogram is actually very good at detecting whether this is a benign lump that is well-defined and sometimes may even be surrounded by halo or a breast cancer which has speculations, has this architecture distortion of the breast, it has even this malignant microcalcification. So in just a little bit about the mammogram, remember this is just simply a plain x-ray of soft tissue of the breast. It uses low voltage and high amperage x-rays and there are two films that are taken. There's the cranial caudal from above downwards and there's a the medial lateral from side to side. So remember the mammogram is usually indicated for those that are above 35. Those that are below 35 usually want to do an ultrasound. And there may be some microcalcifications that may point towards malignancy. They're usually less than 0.5 millimeters. They may be pleomorphic or heterogeneous. They may be grouped. They may be fine. They may be linear or sometimes even branching. The soft tissue shadows may be smooth, round, oval, or regular in these benign conditions, and usually they're irregular in carcinomas. There may be a lobulated mass that is usually suggestive of a carcinoma. The size and the location of the mass can be commented on the mammogram, as well as speculations and the duct distortion, which are features of malignancy, could be seen. So generally, the margins may be circumscribed in benign lesions. They may be lob microlobulated. They may be obscured. They may be ill-defined. They may be speculated. They may be stellate. All these are pointing towards malignant conditions. So here's a picture of a mammogram. As you can see here, there's this calcified um, thing here, calcified benign lesion, and you can see that there's a duct here that is also appearing like as if it is calcified. Then in terms of pathological assessment, you want to do either a fine needle aspiration or a true cut biopsy. So fine needle aspiration, you're going to be getting this syringe, you poke it into the lump, you withdraw certain cells. And then of course you should create a negative pressure of about six mils. So once you withdraw these cells from the lump, you can either fix them on a slide or you could air dry them on a slide and then they could be put in uh, or drawn into a transport medium where they are sent to the lab and then they can be centrifuged. We spin them around, then you actually collect a very thin slide and you smear them on the slide. You can either stain them with hematoxylin or eos and eosin or papanoculo stain. So the advantage of this is that it allows for drainage of cysts if there's fluid that is present and even the, diag the diagnosis then will be most likely that this patient has a benign condition. If the fluid that is actually gotten is bloody, this actually may result in further investigation of the patient. And of course, this advantage of this is that it can sometimes pick, cannot really pick up other pathologies. For example, if there's an underlying intracystic papilloma, which is rarely um, even a carcinoma, it's very, very hard to pick this up on the fine needle aspiration. So again, clinically, the cysts can sometimes come back and even intracystic abnormalities uh, is usually visible on ultrasound, but it's sometimes very hard to pick up some of these underlying um, masses. Then in terms of a true cut biopsy, when cytology is inadequate, this can be helpful. So usually get a core biopsy and here there is minimal invasion. It's a minimal, minimally invasive procedure. It can be done under local anesthesia where you actually get a section of the breast tissue and you send it to histopathology. So this one here has advantages over the fine needle aspiration because you can actually have the actual histology and put this section on a slide to actually see the assessment of the tumor grade. So remember in fine needle aspiration, you're pulling out cells. Here you're pulling out like a tissue. So generally, you can actually grade the tumor using your true cut biopsy. Here's a classification system of cells that are taken from fine needle aspiration. C1 if they're inadequate, C2 if it's no more benign, C3 if they show atypia, which is probably benign, C4 if they show atypia, which is probably malignant, and C5 which is malignant. Remember that someone with a C5 diagnosis on cytology, usually it's supposed to be correlating with the clinical and the radiological features, and this will actually allow the surgeon to carry out this definitive surgical management for the breast cancer. So this is what benign cells actually look like. As you can see, they're nice, well-stained, well-aligned. And here, these are malignant cells which are different shaped. You have some vacuoles that you can see even inside there. Cells are not even of the same size. 
Again, this is breast histology from a biopsy. So here they use immunohistochemistry to show the estrogen receptor, which is positive when you're staining this breast tissue. And here this is a core biopsy of a benign uh, fibroadenoma. So remember, our breast pathologies are going to include congenital anomalies, which I think I did add a slide on this, inflammatory conditions, which I covered in the previous video, benign tumors, which we'll also look at in this particular video, so they're going to be including fibroadenomas, papillomas, fibrocystic changes, which could be nodular lesions, cysts, and even epithelial hyperplasia. Breast cancer, we will look at in a subsequent video. Remember that breast lumps are going to... Uh, the diagnosis is going to vary depending on the age. Generally, like I said, younger people are going to have benign conditions. Older people tend to have malignant conditions. Fibroadenoma is one of the most common pathologies that is going to be diagnosed in young women. And the cysts are common in women between the ages of 30 to 50. All new lumps in someone who's above 50 years are going to be considered as cancer until proven otherwise. So we'll begin with congenital anomalies. You could sometimes, someone could fail to develop the breast tissue. So complete absence of breast development, which is known as amasia, can sometimes happen. And sometimes it may be in the background of someone failing to develop the pectoralis major muscle, which is what's known as Poland syndrome. So in Poland syndrome, you're going to have three things. Amasia, which is lack of development of the breast. You're going to be having absence of the sternal portion of the pectoralis major and a male predominance. So these are the three triads that we see in Poland syndrome. Other causes for the absence of the breast include for example, if you have excised the breast accidentally, the breast lumps should not be excised in children. Like I said, if you excise the breast lump, it will, the, the breast will fail to develop. So breast lumps in children are largely benign. So we don't want to excise any lumps in a, in a child. Sometimes it could be radiotherapy to the chest wall of the child, which could be being used to treat something else. This could actually kill off the breast bud. Sometimes they could have accessory nipples, which I will talk about later on. And besides them just being curiosities, generally they are going to have the same diseases and they're going to be affected the same way as the normal breast tissue. Now, getting into the benign tumors and the fibrocystic changes, these are often due to what we call ANDI pathologies. So this is ANDI just simply stands for aberrational abnormalities and normal development and involution of the breast. So this is going to be covering multiple benign conditions of the breast and they're going to be having overlapping features. Take note that these are not all the benign conditions that you need to know. It's just the common ones and the ones that are of clinical importance. Remember that these anti pathologies are going to be much common in younger perimenopausal women and they're going to be causing a lot of anxiety because every time you get a lump in your breast you're thinking do I have cancer? Am I going to die? But most of them are going to be benign in nature. Any breast lump, like I said, must be evaluated by a triple assessment, which is why I started off with that, which is our clinical assessment, a history and physical examination, radiological assessment, which is going to be either through a mammogram or an ultrasound, and a pathological examination, which is going to be doing a fine needle aspiration or a true cut biopsy. So this is done to actually rule out malignancy, and it should be done whenever you're suspecting malignancy. The first pathology we'll look at is gynecomastia. This is just the presence of breasts in male, resembling those that are of a sexually matured female. Usually tends to be unilateral, but sometimes can be bilateral. It's often physiological when males actually tend to grow much older, they may actually develop gynecomastia, but often needs investigation for those that have hormonal causes, like for example, estrogen or steroid therapy that they're taking for some reason, those patients with liver disease, those patients with pituitary gland tumors, testicular tumors, even those that are using spironolactone, they may develop gynecomastia. The treatment is going to be involving addressing the underlying cause, and in some severe cases, you may actually perform excision of the breast. The next pathology is a breast cyst. Remember a cyst is this fluid-filled cav cavity that is surrounded by an epithelium. So these are going to be fluid-filled cavities in the breast that are surrounded by an epithelium. As you can see, here is an ultrasound of a breast cyst. As you can see here, it's this dark area on the inside that's quite well defined. Remember, fluid appears dark on the ultrasound, and this is most likely consistent with a breast cyst. It's actually quite common. It's one in 14 females above the age of 35 up to menopause. That's between 30, in, between the 30 years, 30s and the 40 years. It actually becomes quite common. It's uncommon after menopause and hormone replacement can actually cause cysts to form in older women. So if you see a cyst 
breast cysts in older women, ask her if she's having any hormonal replacement. Remember, these are going to be arising because you get this destruction and this dilatation of the breast lobules and the terminal ductules. And often it's going to be due to this non-integrated stromal and even epithelial involvement. So the cysts could either be microscopic, you won't be able to see them, or microscopic where you can actually feel them and you can on and you can see them both on ultrasound. If you aspirate from this cyst, you may get this straw colored, green colored, or even opaque fluid. And remember that the cysts tend to vary with menstruation due to the influence of the ovarian um, hormones. Then they can present as multiple in about 50% of the cases and often bilateral affecting both breasts and they may sometimes become tender. So the cysts can recur in about 50% of the cases. When you examine this patient, it's going to be this smooth, soft, fluctuating and even transilluminating well-localized swelling. So again, investigations, you want to do an ultrasound of the breast, you can do a fine needle aspiration, a mammogram of course to rule out any underlying carcinoma. A differential diagnosis is going to include a blood good cyst, a uh, hematoma, a cystic necrosis, and a carcinoma, a Brody's disease, which is a phyloides tumor, which we'll talk about towards the end of this lecture, a galactosil, a lymph cyst, and a hydatid cyst. Treatment is just simply reassurance. You aspirate it for two times. Surgical uh, excision can actually be done if the cyst recurs after two aspirations. Or if there's bloody discharge or if there's any residual mass that is felt, then they may need some surgical excision. The next pathology is, of course, fibrocystic change, or what I like to call lumpy breasts. So this is due, again, to the Andy pathologies, the aberration in normal development and involution of the breast. So here they are going to have this cyclic nostalgia with nodularity. That's what it was. That's what we now want to refer to this condition as cyclic nostalgia with nodularity. So you have two words here, fibro, which is fibrous component, Cystic, which may be associated with cysts, and fibro could sometimes even be associated with certain glands like fibroadenosis, where there are these glands that may sometimes form changes that are happening inside the breast tissue. Then, of course, you have these two conditions coming together. So there's a fibrous component, and there's, of course, a cystic component. So they are fibrous and even associated with glands sometimes, and then you have a lot of these cysts inside the breast. So they give this appearance of the breast to feel lumpy. And of course, it will be discomfort in the background of a generally lumpy breast. So that's what we refer to as fibroadenosis. Remember that this condition is dependent on estrogen. However, sometimes estrogen therapy and even oral contraceptives don't seem to actually even increase the incidence of this condition, seeing that a lot of women and a lot of patients are actually on these estrogen-based contraceptives. It's actually the most common breast disease, premenopausal, and it's going to be occurring in the upper outer quadrant. This shouldn't surprise you because most of the breast tissue is found in the upper outer quadrant. So the changes actually tend to arise during reproductive age and are most likely to, as a consequence of this cyclic breast changes that occur in the normal menstrual cycle. So it's just simply an exaggerated response of the stroma of the breast and the epithelium to the different hormones, to the different growth factors that are there. It's quite rare in naliparous women. It's quite rare in women that are ovulating. It's quite rare in those that are taking oral contraceptive pills. So the breast involution actually causes changes at microscopic level. They can cause fibrosis, which is an increase in the fibrous component. They could cause adenosis, which is an increase in these glandular elements, or they could cause this apocrine changes where the normal epithelium that's lining the ducts actually can become like the epithelium that is, aligning, that is found lining the sweat glands. So in addition, they may sometimes have some minimal hyperplasia of the epithelial cells that are lining the ducts that sometimes can occur. And of course, Swollen breast cysts can also develop. The stages are as follows. Stage one, you may have the stromal proliferation or hyperplasia. Stage two, you have adenosis where there's increase in the glands. And stage three, you have cysts forming. So these cysts have this blue dome appearance when you look at them on gross examination. Microscopically, they may have non-proliferative changes, which are very common to see. You may have a lot of this stromal fibrosis with the dilatation of the ducts. You may have these microcysts that are forming on histology. Then when you actually look at the histology, sometimes you may have proliferative changes. You may have three things. You may either have epitheliosis, which is happening in the ducts of the breast. It could be happening in the acini. Remember, under normal circumstances, the normal ducts and the lobuli and the lobules rather have two 
types of or two layers of epithelium. They have the myoepithelium, which are going to be these cells which have contractile properties to contract and push out milk. And then they also have the luminal cells, which are, of course, lining the lumen of the cells. So the epithelial hyperplasia is going to be recognized by the presence of more than two layers that you see in these areas. And they may range to mild, sometimes it may be orderly, or could be atypical hyperplasia, which may sometimes even resemble a carcinoma in situ, in situ. Remember, this carcinoma in situ are the ones that are cancers that are just uh, confined to above the basement membrane, the cancer that hasn't breached the basement membrane. You may sometimes have sclerosing adenosis, which can mimic carcinomas. So here the lesions are going to be having this, a lot of this intralobular fibrosis, a lot of proliferation of the small ducts and the asini that we find in the breast. You may sometimes have papillomatosis, which is happening within the ducts and often associated with apocrine metaplasia. How do these people present? They're going to be presenting during the menstrual age, so between 35 to 50 years. It's often bilateral, it's quite painful, it's diffuse. You get this granular, this tender swelling, what I like to call a lumpy breast, that is better felt by the palpating fingers. It's common in the outer upper quadrant. It shouldn't be a surprise to most of you by now. You may have pain and tenderness, which is much more prominent just before the menstrual um, cycle. We call that a cyclic nostalgia. It often subsides during pregnancy, lactation, and after menopause. There may sometimes be a discharge that is serous in nature or sometimes even occasionally greenish in color. You investigate them by doing a fine needle aspiration, which may show epitheliosis when florid is actually undoubtedly pre-malignant. You should investigate this patient and treat this patient accordingly. An ultrasound as well as a mammogram. Management could be conservative. You reassure the patient, you tell them to avoid caffeine, avoid chocolates, avoid salt. And of course, there are some drugs that can be used. These are indicated when the fibroadenosis is not increasing in size. There is no nipple discharge, especially that of blood, and there's no uh, psychological effect. Then surgery could sometimes be done where you do a subcutaneous mastectomy where you preserve the nipple, you preserve the areola, and you preserve the skin. And then a prosthesis can actually be placed only in severe disease and those that have persistent disease. Sometimes we can excise the cyst or local excision of the diseased tissue. This is usually done for those that have intractable pain, those that have florid epitheliosis that we see on fine needle aspiration, those that have a blood, a blood good cyst, those that have persistent bloody discharge, those that have um, psycho psychological reasons. Remember that this condition is benign, but you may get some changes that may put this patient at risk of developing carcinoma. If you see any of these things, you should intervene because it puts them at risk of developing breast cancer. And remember, the risk is not just with that breast which is affected, but it's with both the breasts. So there could be things like fib fibrosis, cystic change, and even mild hyperplasia and apocrine met metaplasia. These ones have a minimal risk, or sometimes they don't even have significant risk. And those that have slightly increased risk, about 1.5 to 2 times, those that have moderate to florid hyperplasia without atypia, any duct papillomatosis or any sclerosing adenosis. Those that have significant risk, more than five times risk, is those that have atypical hyperplasia, whether it's happening in the ducts, whether it's happening in the lobules. Remember that fibrocystic change can only be distinguished from cancer through the biopsy, through histological examination. The proliferative fibrocystic change usually is going to be bilateral and multifocal and sometimes associated with increased risk of underlying carcinoma in both the breasts. Then we'll move to a very common type of tumor, which is known as a fibroadenoma. Fibro meaning it has a fibrous component. Adenoma, it means it has glands. And remember, it's ending in oma, it's a benign tumor. So this is a benign encapsulated tumor that's going to be seen in many young females aged between 20 to 30 years. It is considered as hyperplasia of a single lobule of the breast. So it's classified under the Andy pathologies, the aberrations in normal development and involution of the breast. It's actually the most common benign tumor in those that are below the age of 30 in females. So 15% of them are going to be palpable breast lumps, very common in black individuals. 20% of them are going to be bilateral and 20% of them are going to be multiple in certain cases. So it's this Andy pathology that is going to be affecting a lobule. Although it shows similar hormonal activities of the normal breast, like lactation, things like perimenopausal uh, involution, 
The fibroadenoma does not turn into malignancies. 30% of the fibroadenoma is actually going to disappear or reduce in size in about 2 to 4 years. 10 to 20% of them will increase in size progressively and these are not going to be occurring after menopause unless if the woman is on this hormonal replacement therapy. So how do they present? You have this painless mass which is very mobile. We call it a, a mouse, a breast mouse. You can actually move it like a mouse inside the breast. It's well localized, it moves freely, it's smooth, it's firm, it's non-tender. When you examine it on gross examination it may be soft. These are usually common after 30 years. They're more cellular and they're often bilateral. Or they may be hard, which are common in those individuals below 30 years, and these ones tend to have a fibrous component when you examine them. Or they may be giant, those that are greater than five centimeters. These are common in Africa. The microscopic examination could reveal they could be intracanaliculi. These are, tend to be large and soft. They're mainly cellular. The stroma is going, to be dis, is going to be with this distorted ducts, and it's going to be carrying the potential of undergoing malignant transformation. Out of the, the fibroadenomas, the ones that have intracanaliculi, type microscopically are the ones that are going to be putting you at risk of malignant transformation. Then the pericanalicular are small and hard and mainly fibrous and of course the stroma is with the normal ducts. You could sometimes have a juvenile fibroadenoma which occurs in adolescence. Here there's this rapid growth of the stroma and the epithelial hyperplasia and remember this does not show any of the alterations in the stroma, epithelium uh, balance, or any cell atypia or any periductal cell concentration. This clinically is going to be quite similar to the phyloides tumor, but it does not turn into a phyloides tumor or does it turn into a carcinoma. So here's a, fi a large fibroadenoma of the left breast in a 14-year-old. And sometimes you may have a complex fibroadenoma which occurs in an older aged group. Here there's going to be this typical fibroadenoma with the fibrocystic changes. So you may have ap apocrine metaplasia, you may have cyst formation, you may have sclerosing adenosis. 15% of the proven fibroadenomas are actually complex fibroadenomas and occasionally they turn into malignancy unlike the usual fibroadenomas that we see. This here is a fibroadenoma of a left breast on ultrasound. Occasionally you want to actually do, actually not even occasionally, you want to do a core biopsy to actually confirm the diagnosis and the other investigations that you're going to do a mammogram that are going to be showing this smooth regular shadow, a fine needle aspiration, excuse me, and sometimes an ultrasound to confirm the solid nature of the condition. Management of the condition is you want to excise this thing, you want to remove this thing. So excision is going to be made by making this circum areola incision, sorry for that. So as you can see, you're going to be making an incision around the areola. You also make another incision, or you could make another incision rather, which is submammary. So you could either use the Webster's approach, or you could use the uh, Galliard thomas incision, which is the submammary, and usually these are done under general anesthesia. So for the fibro adenoma, which is small, less than 3 centimeters, those that are single, in a patient that is aged less than 30 years, you can actually leave them alone. No need for you to excise them. Just follow up this patient regularly, get them ultrasounds every six months to check if there are any changes that you can notice that are pointing towards malignancy, if they're increasing in size. But of course, there are some patients that will have anxiety, and this is actually the most difficult part for the conservational management. Then in terms of surgery, those that have a size greater than three centimeters, those that are multiple, those that are giant greater than five centimeters, those that tend to recur, if it's for cosmesis purposes or if it's a complex type of fibroadenoma, you want to actually excise them and you want to remove them. In terms of hyperplasia of the breast, remember he, this is often asymptomatic and usually just discovered by chance. So there's an increase in the number of epithelial cells of the lobules and the ducts. So it could either be ductal hyperplasia or it could be lobular hyperplasia. So the grade is based on the microscopy as mild, moderate and florid, which is more extensive. And this is often associated with natural changes, especially in women above 35 years. In terms of atypical hyperplasia, generally here they're going to be abnormally appearing cells. It could be abnormality in shape, abnormality in pattern, and the way these cells are arranged. So sometimes it could be atypical ductal hyperplasia affecting the ducts, or atypical ductal lobular hyperplasia. Sometimes it's often just discovered on breast biopsy. There is an increased risk of developing cancer in atypical ductal hyperplasia. In terms of ductal papillomas, these are going to be like this, finger-like. Remember, papillomas like finger-like projection. So these ductal papillomas are these 
epithelial lined true polyps that we see of the lactiferous ducts. So they are usually about one centimeter, in, less than one centimeter in size, and they're going to be this small lump underneath the areola, this sub areola mass. But if they're large enough, they can actually become quite big. Sometimes they may have a vascular stalk, as is seen in this picture here, and they may hang like that as a, as a pedunculated mass. Rarely they can be cystic soft swelling that may be found underneath um, the breast. And then of course, this is probably due to the obstruction of the uh, duct by the papilloma. So remember that duct papilloma is the most common cause of bloody nipple discharge from the breast. And usually it's going to be arising from a single lactiferous duct. It's often due to blockage of the duct, which causes the duct to dilate. So they're going to be this papillaris, papilliferous swelling, these projections which are usually near the nipple orifice, and sometimes there may be a blood discharge that may be there. Sometimes there may be a serosanguinous discharge that may occur. Remember that the single papilloma is not premalignant, but if you have multiple papillomas, then you should consider this as premalignant. Peripheral papillomas should be differentiated from the invasive papillary carcinoma. The types could be sub-areola, which is the most common, just found underneath the areola. You could have the peripheral, which is occasionally seen. Other common things are solitary, which is a single, multiple. Sometimes you have it unilateral, sometimes you have it bilateral. And of course, investigations are similar to the other pathologies. So you want to do a discharge of the study. You want to inject contrast into the duct, do a ducto, the ductogram. You want to actually get a mammogram that may show this dense lesion underneath the areoli. The treatment is... Um, Microdectomy, which is, of course, the lactiferous duct is opened, the papilloma is excised using the tennis racket incision. So probing the lactiferous duct is usually done up to five centimeters and excised with part of the areola skin. Remember that the intraductal papillary carcinoma usually is not going to be arising from a pre-existing duct papilloma. Remember, duct papilloma benign intraductal papillary carcinoma malignant. So it arises as a new condition on its own. Papillomatosis is pretty much hyperplasia of the duct that is filling the duct like a polyp without a pedunculated stalk. So it's not really a true polyp. It is not duct papilloma, but it's going to be part of the fibrocyst, fibrocyst adenosis. Then you may also have the axillary nodules that are not involved, or axillary nodules rather, are not involved in this condition. Then you may have adenosis of the breast. This is non-cancerous enlargement of the breast lobules. And remember that adenosis can sometimes look like breast cancer, even on the mammogram. So you want to actually get a biopsy to actually rule out breast cancer. Then moving on to phyloides tumor, this is just simply a cyst sarcoma, or you can call it as a, a serocystic disease of Brody or cyst sarcoma phyloides. So these are not simply just giant fibromas. Some people think of them as just giant fibromas. They are not. So there's a spectrum of the activity. Some of them are almost benign. 85% of them are benign. And sometimes there could be metastatic tumor in about 15%. They occur in perimenopausal women about 30 to 50 years. They're usually going to present as this unilateral, rapidly growing uh, mass. Sometimes it can have uh, bosselated surfaces. And they're quite large, as you can see in this particular picture here. They are smooth. They are non-tender, they are soft, they may fluctuate with necrosis over the skin where there is a lot of pressure and they differ from carcinoma because number one, the skin over the breast is going to be stretched, it's going to be red with dilated veins. The tumor is warm and it's not fixed to the skin or the deeper muscles of the chest. There's no nipple retraction, the lymph nodes are usually not involved. This tends to be recurrent. Investigations you want to do, of course, ultrasound, fine needle aspiration, a core biopsy, a mammogram, a chest x-ray to actually, and even a, a CT chest to rule out any malignancy uh, that have spread to these particular areas. The treatment is, of course, excision or a subcutaneous mastectomy. If it's malignant, a sarcoma, then you want to perform a total mastectomy. Then to end this lecture off, I want to talk about galactoria and the galactosil. A galactosil is just simply arising from lactation during uh, cystic dilatation of an obstructed duct. You get this duct that is obstructed and this begins to dilate and this usually happens during lactation. That's a galactosil. Galactoria is just simply secretion of milk not related to pregnancy or lactation. It's not a symptom of breast cancer. 
Sometimes, it's most of the times it's actually going to be bilateral. It could be primary galactoria, which is due to stress and other factors. It can also be physiological in puberty or menopause. You just simply reassure the patient. Or it could be secondary. There are things that can cause galactoria. Dopamine receptor antagonists like haloperidol, methyl dopa, clopromazine, metoclopramide, or even hyperprolactinemia due to certain pituitary tumors. These can enhance the prolactin activity and can stimulate the production of milk. You could have hypothyroidism, drugs like oral contraceptives, atenolol, clonidine, ranitidine, Ectopic prolactin secreting tumors could be a bronchogenic carcinoma in terms of a perineoplastic syndrome or a chronic renal failure. Management of this is, of course, you want to estimate the level levels of serum prolactin, T3, T4, and TSH. Get a CT scan of or an MRA of the head. You may give them bromocryptin therapy and as well as treat the underlying cause. If you stop the drug that is causing this, and remember that you can substitute with different drugs that are needed for the condition. Sometimes you may have what is known as witch's milk, a witch, witch's milk. This is where you get secretion of milk in uh, both male and female infants. This is just because the mother has passed down a lot of estrogen and a lot of these hormones during pregnancy. So they will have a high concentration of these hormones when they are born and these infants could sometimes produce this breast milk. So just reassure the mother they shouldn't be worried. Usually it lasts up to three weeks after childbirth. I really hope you enjoyed this video on the benign breast conditions. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon so you never miss on such amazing content every time I post. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazebu. Until next time, bye-bye.